this morning when I was uh, speaking on that subject that in the summer series, not uh, this Wednesday night, but the following, you have a speaker scheduled to speak on salvation and baptism. It happens to be my dad. <laughs> uh, so I was not trying to preempt his subject. I really didn't pay enough attention and think about that because of all the baptisms this week at camp. It's very much on my mind. And uh, like I said, I didn't cover all of the things that were in the uh, document that came from the internet. So he's going to, he's agreed to go ahead and and finish in his message covering some things that uh, we didn't get to. Uh, so uh, that will still be definitely a, a subject that will uh, command your attention and uh, give you even further information about it. The Bible says so much on the subject and there's so much error in the religious world on the subject, there's still plenty of material uh, to address regarding that. And uh, so we certainly would encourage you to uh, maybe get a recording of that as well and combine it with the other to give to your friends so they can study this subject. Now for this afternoon, to judge or not to judge, that is the question. And if you ask some people the answer, you're going to get different answers depending on which person you ask. Some would uh, say, if they don't know any other verse in the Bible, they do know this one, judge not that you be not judged. They can quote that one to you. But maybe some are not aware that the same Jesus who said, judge not that you be not judged in Matthew 7 and verse 1, said something else in John chapter 7 and verse 24. And I want to begin there this afternoon, John 7 and verse number 24. In John 7, 24, Jesus says, Judge not according to appearance, but judge. But what kind of judgment are we commanded to judge? But judge righteous judgment. And so there are times when judgment is forbidden. There are times when judgment is commanded. And the issue is, how do we know which time is which? So I want to look at those extremes with you very quickly this afternoon. Number one, let's take extreme number one, the idea that says you never judge at all under any circumstance. It's interesting to me that some people would come up to you and say, don't judge. And you want to say, are you making a judgment about whether I should be making a judgment? Uh, because when you say don't judge, you've judged judging to be wrong, but by doing so, you've contradicted yourself. Because if you cannot make any judgments at all ever, how could you make a judgment that it's wrong to make a judgment? That shows that there are times when judgments are indeed accepted, even in the minds of those who say don't do it. They do it when it suits them. Now, the same passage in which you find the words, judge not that you be not judged, fortunately, go on and give us some more information that show us the kind of judging that Jesus is addressing. Look at verses 2 and following of Matthew 7. Verse 1 is the one that says, judge not that you be not judged. And then verse 2. For with what judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged. With what measure ye meet, it shall be measured to you again. And then this, why beholdest thou the mote, the speck, that's in thy brother's eye, but considerest not the beam that is in thine own eye? How wilt thou say to thy brother, let me pull out the mote out of thine eye, and behold, a beam is in thine own eye? Thou hypocrite. There it is. The kind of judging Jesus has on his mind in Matthew 7, 1 is a hypocritical type judgment in which one would ignore their own sins so that they could focus on someone else's to the exclusion of dealing with their own. And you'll notice he says, interestingly, and th this is a verse that people never get far enough to when they make these don't judge statements. Isn't it interesting that in verse 5, Jesus said, Thou hypocrite, first cast out of the beam out of thine own eye, and then, does he say, leave your brother's speck alone? No, he says, then you can see more clearly to help cast out the mote out of thy brother's eye. Does the mote need to be removed from your brother's eye? Yes, and you can help him do it more clearly when you've taken care of the beam or the log that's sticking out of your eye. In this same passage, John, Matthew 7 rather, go down to verse 13. He says, enter in at the straight gate, wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leads to destruction. Many there be which go in thereat. And then this, there's a narrow gate 
There is a narrow way and it leads to life and few there be that find it. Beware of false prophets. Stop. Doesn't that require me to make a judgment about whether someone is or is not a false prophet? And how would I go about making such a determination as to whether a man is telling me truth or error? How could I know if he's false? Well, Jesus goes on to say in verse 16, ye shall know them by their fruits. And then he says, every good tree is going to bring forth good fruit. Verse 17, a corrupt tree will bring forth evil fruit. Verse 20, wherefore by their fruits ye shall know them. Someone's noted, I think Brother Keeble used to say it a lot, we're fruit inspectors. And we're supposed to be examining the fruit before we take a bite and know that uh, we are going to have to make a judgment about whether it's good fruit or not. And look, I'm just going to rattle these off for your interest and study for later on because we don't have the time or luxury of time to really focus on them. Read Romans 13 and see how the civil courts make judgments that are authorized by God for them to make. And there is a judgment that has to be made that's approved by God. What about 3 John? Look at 3 John verse 9. In this short epistle, what does John tell his reader here in this passage to do, the well-beloved Gaius, whom he loves in the truth. He tells him in verse number 9 of Third John, I wrote unto the church. Well, how did that go, John? Well, he said, Diotrephes, who loveth to have the preeminence among them, receiveth us not. And if I come, I'll remember his deeds which he doeth, prating against us with malicious words. He's not content therewith. He doesn't receive the brethren, and he forbids them that would, and he casts them out of the church. So here's a man making judgments that were improper, but then look at what verse 11 says. Beloved, follow not that which is evil, but that which is good. Well, how will I know whether I'm following evil or good? I have to make a judgment. Based on what? Based on evidence. And this is my evidence right here. It's not hearsay. It's what he said. And then you read Galatians 6, 1. How can I do what Galatians 6, 1 tells me to do if I can't make any judgments ever, ever, ever? Galatians 6, 1 says, brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, stop. How would you know if he is or isn't overtaken in a fault? You would have to find that a man has committed a fault in order to know whether he is overtaken in a fault and needs what the rest of the verse prescribes, which is what? Ye which are spiritual, restore such an one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. You do it in that right spirit. James chapter 5 says essentially the same thing. If you convert a brother from the error of his way, what have you done for him? James 5, 19, brethren, if any of you do err from the truth and one convert him, well, how would you know that a brother needs to be converted because he has given us a standard by which we could know. Let him know that he which converteth the sinner from the error of his way has been meddling where he ought not be meddling and he shouldn't have been judging. No, that's not what the verse says. It says he's saving a soul from death and hiding a multitude of sins. Now, I don't have the time to look at it um, in detail with you, but I want you to keep in mind that uh, the Bible makes it abundantly clear in, uh, in this passage of Scripture that we've been noting that we have false teachers uh, galore, unfortunately, just like they did in their day and time. You read 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 18 and 19. See if you could do what Paul told Timothy to do without making any judgment of any kind. He said, Timothy, according to the prophecies, 1 Timothy 1, 18, I want you to war a good warfare, holding faith in a good conscience, he mentions uh, that Hymenaeus and Alexander had been delivered unto Satan that they may learn not to blaspheme. And then if you go to 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 15, he mentions Hermogenes and Phagellus that he says have turned away. Paul's making judgments about these men that are inspired judgments. And then look at 2 Timothy 2, 17 and 18. Their word will eat like a cancer, he says. Of whom is Hymenaeus and Philetus, who concerning the truth of Erd. How do you know that, Paul? How can you judge them? Because they have violated the truth 
and uh, they've said the resurrection's passed already. They're overthrowing the faith of some. Is that a big deal? Indeed it is. And then finally, under the category of you can never judge at all, well, look at 2 Corinthians, make it 1 Corinthians 5 would be better since that's where it is. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, and notice the statement that is made there in 1 Corinthians 5. Here's a brother in the church uh, that, that has his father's wife. And what is the church at Corinth doing about it? Bragging? Look how tolerant we are. Look how we are accepting of people where they are. Uh, they're puffed up. They hadn't mourned that he that had done this deed might be taken away from among them. They were treating this with uh, very little concern. And Paul tells them in verse 4, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, there's the authority behind it. When you gather together in my spirit with the power, the authority of our Lord Jesus Christ, deliver such a one to Satan for the destruction of the flesh. Why would you do that? That sounds hateful. No, it's not when you realize the goal that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. I know of a church in New Zealand some years ago that had a, a young lady they had to withdraw from. And when they did... I found out she was planning to come to the New Year's Eve get-together and she was planning to eat a meal with everyone there and just enjoy the party. If you'll read verse 11 of 1 Corinthians chapter 5 with me, you'll notice Paul says, I've written unto you not to keep company if any man that's called a brother is a fornicator, covetous, idolater, railer, drunkard, extortioner, with such an one know not to eat. For what have I to do to judge them also that are without? Do not you, watch this, judge them that are within. But them that are without, those who aren't in the church, God will judge them. Therefore, put away from among yourselves that wicked person. They were required to make a judgment about that fornicator among them, that uh, drunkard among them, etc. You saw the list. And they were required to make a judgment and to deal with it to try to jolt that person. So in New Zealand, this girl finds out that she's not able to come to the party unless she repents of her sins. And her parents threw a conniption fit. We're very, very angry. Said that's not Christian love. They said a lot of things. Sunday morning came. The party was on Saturday night. She didn't come to the party. Sunday morning came. She came walking down the aisle, tears streaming down her cheeks, sat down on the front bench, wrote out a statement of repentance and said, I'm so very sorry. I never realized how much I treasured the fellowship of my brothers and sisters in this church until I couldn't have it. This motivated me to weigh and examine my life and say, would I rather lose my church family or give up these sins? And she said, I would rather give up my sinful lifestyle than to lose my family. And she said, thank you for not letting me come so that I would be awoken to my true situation. Wow. God knows what he's doing and judgments are not easy. Sometimes they're very, very hard but they have to be done with a good goal in mind. Now let's look at some extremes in the other direction as we close. There are people who make judgments they do not make correctly. We judge improperly when we, number one, judge others just to try to justify our own shortcomings. Look at John 12 with me. You find a man that does this very thing in John 12. His name is Judas. What does Judas say in John chapter 12 when he sees this Mary take a pound of ointment of spikenard, it was notice verse 3 of John 12 says it was very costly. Anointed the feet of Jesus with it, wiped his feet with her hair. The whole house is filled with this pleasant aroma. And one of his disciples, verse 4, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, the one that would betray him, he asked, and you can almost hear the end righteous indignation or self-righteous indignation in this case in his voice. Why was not this ointment sold for 300 pence and given to the poor? 
Now, he's saying this is, un, this is not right. This is not a, the right way to use this. We could have sold this and given it to the poor. So it looks like Judas is really genuinely concerned about the poor. But what does the next verse tell you? This he said, not that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief. He had the bag. He was the treasurer. He bare what was put therein. And when this is wasted in his mind, he's thinking, if we had kept that and sold it, I would have had more money to put in this bag from which I could steal. So his apparent self-righteousness was not really true. It was a mask, a mask he was wearing to try to cover up something he wanted to do with that money. I want you to notice Luke 18. You talk about self-righteous. Here's a self-righteous man who is so puffed up with his own self-importance that he can only talk about himself. Jesus spoke a parable to those who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. Two men went to the temple to pray, one Pharisee, the other publican. What does the Pharisee do? Stood. You can see him standing so upright. And he prayed thus with himself, God, I thank thee that I am not as other men are, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this publican over here. No, I fast twice in the week. I give tithes of all that I possess. And if you'd listen to this prayer, if, if that wasn't the end of it, I suspect the more you listen, the more you would have heard about him, 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 him. This publican, he won't even lift up his eyes so much to heaven. He smites his breast and says, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And Jesus said, I tell you this, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone that exalts himself, he'll be brought low. You humble yourself, you'll be brought higher by God. So this righteous man brags on his righteousness by looking at everyone else's unrighteousness. And that is certainly sinful. Now, Someone said that faults are like headlights of a car. Everyone else's headlights seem to be brighter than yours. And uh, someone else said that uh, a woman was constantly criticizing her neighbor for hanging dirty laundry out on the clothesline. Now, clotheslines don't seem to be all that popular in our day and time, but there was a time when that's where the clothes went. After they were washed, out on the clothesline to dry. And this one neighbor said, my neighbor keeps putting dirty laundry out on the line. Why would you do that? You go to all the trouble to wash it, and then you put dirty laundry out on the clothesline. And then one day she noticed the dirty streaks she'd been seeing were on her window pane. It wasn't her neighbor's problem after all. And I certainly don't want to be like that husband that said to his new wife after they got back on the honeymoon, Now, darling... Now that we're married and we're back home and we're settling into our lifestyle here at home, I hope you won't mind if I point out a few of your faults. <laughs> and she responded and said, oh, no, I don't mind at all. After all, it was those faults that kept me from getting a better husband. So, <laughs> touche, <laughs> right? I don't want to be that guy that can see everything everyone else is doing wrong but can never see what I need to improve. We've got to be careful to, to consider ourselves. What does Paul say to the Ephesian elders? Take heed to yourselves and to the flock over which the Holy Spirit's made you overseers. What does Paul say to the young evangelist Timothy? Take heed to thyself and the doctrine. So it starts with my own self-examination. Number two of four, I do not want to judge hypocritically. Look at Romans 2 for a classic case of this kind of hypocritical judgment. Romans chapter 2, beginning at verse 20, he mentions those who are confident of themselves. Oh, you're an instructor of the foolish. You're a teacher of the babes, verse 20. Uh, you've the form of knowledge of the truth and the law. And uh, thou therefore that teachest another, teachest thou not thyself? Thou that preachest a man should not steal, dost thou steal? Thou that sayest a man should not commit adultery, oh, do you? commit adultery and so 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 many times we're quick to point out the faults of others 
by ignoring our own when, in fact, sometimes someone said, when you're pointing an accusing finger at others, you've got three fingers pointing back at you. Don't forget that. Next, number three, we judge rashly. Sometimes we judge before we have all of the facts, and it's easy to do. Years ago, I lived in Knoxville, Tennessee, and preached there. A college friend of mine moved to the area. He was going to attend services where I preached the next Sunday, the next day, in fact. On Saturday, he went to the West Town Mall there in Knoxville, as it was called then. And uh, as he's walking up and down the aisles toward the mall of cars that are there, as he's walking up and down the aisle of cars that are there headed toward the mall, he sees a pink Cadillac with a license plate on the back that's personalized that read B.J. Clark. Pink Cadillac with B.J. Clark's name on it. He's thinking, wow, B.J. has demonstrating a softer side since college. I didn't know he was driving a pink Cadillac. So he gets inside and there at the entrance to the mall it says paintings inside by B.J. Clark. So I didn't think B.J. painted. So uh, he walks up to a table where a woman is sitting and there are paintings all around and he said is B.J. Clark here? And she said yes. And he said well where is he? And she said I'm B.J. Clark. And he said, no, you're not. And she said, yes, I am. And she said, are you looking for the preacher? And he said, well, yes, do you know him? She says, I don't know that man, but I get his calls all the time. <laughs> Little information that helped me out. One night someone called our house. Tish answered, is B.J. Clark there? Well, what's she going to say? <laughs> yes. So I answered the phone. Do you still have that painting? I'm sorry, what? Do you still have that painting you did? I said, um, the only painting I ever did was in the seventh grade, and my art teacher said, throw it away. And that's, that's exactly what happened. I said, so I don't think I'm the guy you're looking for. Come to find out there's a woman named B.J. Clark who sold Mary Kay and was a painter, and she drove a pink Cadillac. And so if you look at the evidence and all of the evidence and gather all of the facts, suddenly you see that, oh, this is the case. I remember some years ago, Brother Curtis Cates was written up by a preacher for appearing at a lectureship with another preacher that had a certain name. Only thing is, the name of this preacher was... The same name, but a different preacher than the one that had done all the stuff that was so questionable. And so Brother Cates had not appeared on the lectureship with a false teacher by that name. He had appeared by, uh, on the lectureship with another preacher that had the same name. But this brother that wrote the article exposing Brother Cates for his ill-timed decision to speak at such and such a place with this person, guess what he did when he found out? that he was wrong and that he'd written up something that wasn't even true. Did he write an apology and say, I'm sorry? No, he said, well, I've already written the article. It's already been sent out. Wow. Sometimes we get so angry so fast and we don't even know the whole facts. Man on a passenger train and there's this baby crying in the same compartment where he is. And the baby is crying and making a lot of noise and this man's holding the baby and trying desperately to pacify the child and the child is just wailing. And finally, this other man in the compartment thinks he's speaking for the rest of the group and he says, will you please take that child to its mother so she can calm the baby down and we can all get some rest, please? And the man holding the screaming baby said, I would like nothing more than to take this child to its mother. But this child's mother is in a coffin on the back of this train. And I'm doing the best I can. Oh. Well, I'm sorry. So many times we speak first and find out facts later on. We can't do that. And sometimes we are so easy on others and yet so hard on our 
uh, excuse me, so easy on ourselves, so hard on others. I remember some years ago, we had a family uh, get together and we probably had 12 to 14 family members in the house. I got selected to go to Captain D's to get uh, food and drinks for everyone. For some reason I went by myself. And so when I got there to Captain D's, they said, oh, um, we don't have any uh, drink carriers. I said, well, what am I, how am I going to get all those drinks back home safely? Now, I will tell you in advance, I'm one of these people, when I'm at a red light and the red light goes green and I'm behind someone that's in front of me and the light's green, if they don't hit the accelerator immediately, I tend to get a little impatient. What about you? Am I the only person? I'm like, come on, let's go. The light is green. Can we go? Go. We've got places to go here. Let's go. Let's go. On this particular night, they found some boxes that were big boxes, and they tried to wedge the drinks in there, but they were not snug. And so I put them in the floorboard, and I pulled out of Captain D's, and I came to the light, and I'm the first one in line. When the light goes green, if I hit the accelerator like I normally do, those drinks are going everywhere. And so I ease out of my spot, and this guy behind me is like honking and all angry with me and everything. And I'm thinking, man, if you just understood. And I'm thinking, how many times have I been behind someone that just came from chemo treatments? And maybe the reason the person in front of me is driving slow is because the person in the car has a bad back and every sudden movement jerks that back. And maybe I need to be more charitable and understanding sometimes about what could be happening rather than assuming the worst first. Finally, we judge improperly when we judge with partiality. God doesn't judge men partially. He's no respecter of persons. He's the perfect judge. You'll find that emphasized at least six times in the New Testament that God is not a face looker. He doesn't look at your face and then decide whether he will or won't help you, love you. You read it in Acts 10, 34, Romans 2, 11, so many other passages. And so I want to be one of these individuals that is just like God, that I'm not a respecter of persons. But what if that person is my own family member. This would have had to be so hard, but under the law of Moses, if your own family member tried to get you to go and serve idol gods with them, Deuteronomy 13 said that if, if your own brother tried to get you to become an idolater, if your, son, your, if your own son, your own daughter tried to get you to become an idolater, not only do you say no to them, you have to report that they tried to thrust you away from God and the, they have to be stoned and you have to be the first one to throw a stone. That would not be easy. But you know, sometimes we condemn other people for what they are doing and then we give a free pass to ourselves or to our children or to our family members who are doing the same things. We've got to remember who the ultimate judge is, and we've got to be consistent. Brother Wendell Winkler used to tell about this mother who praised her daughter's new husband. She said, my daughter got the best husband. He lets her sleep late. He, he tells her to pamper herself at the beauty parlor, takes her out to eat, never makes her cook at all, ever, under any circumstance. On the other hand, uh, my, my son's new wife, uh, she's lazy. She sleeps in late every morning. She's always going to the beauty parlor. She'll never cook for him. Wait a minute. I thought those were virtues in the other. We, we tend to make exceptions for those that we know and love. I'll tell you, here's the ultimate standard of judgment right here. The word that Christ has spoken will judge us in the last day. And I know that he's going to be a fair judge. And I want to live for him and make sure that if I go to bed at night and I know he's happy with me because I've done the best I can do according to his will, that that is what matters most. We certainly love your soul. And if you're not a member of the Lord's church, we'd love for you to become one. 
by hearing, believing, repenting, confessing, and being baptized for the remission of sins. Why would you need to do all of those things? Because if you read the book of Acts, all of those things are emphasized in those cases of conversion. And so we would encourage you to do what the Bible says. If you're already a child of God, but you've wandered away from God and you need to come home, we beg you to do it. And then, you know what, let me say this as I, as I close, and when I used to be the preacher at South Haven, they used to guess which conclusion is he really going to have as a final conclusion. This is it. This is final conclusion. When the prodigal came home, there was some judging going on of a negative kind by the brother, the elder brother, who was basically wanting to remember the past sins rather than focus on the present commitment to change. And you know, sometimes people go out and they do things that are wrong, dead wrong. But then they decide to change. And some folks want to focus on what they did in the past rather than on what they're doing in the present. And that's not good. We've got to look to the future with grace and forgiveness and mercy. And if you need that grace, mercy, and forgiveness right now, God will run to meet you to give it to you as together we stand and sing, won't you please?